morning comes from Hebrews chapter 11, looking at decisions and consequences. We know that any time we look at anyone's life, including our own, that we can find where we have made good decisions and we, have, we can find where we have made some pretty lousy ones. Moses was a man who was not exempt from that. He made some great decisions and he made some lousy ones as well. This morning I want to show what lessons we can learn from the decisions of Moses as we find them in Hebrews chapter 11, as we find them discussed in Hebrews chapter 11. We know, if we think about Hebrews 11, we find it a chapter we know as the great faith chapter. If you highlight the word by faith or the phrase by faith, like I did in my Bible, it becomes very colorful very quickly because that phrase is used over and over and over again. And no doubt Moses is no exception by that, uh, from that. He is one who did many things by faith, and by that we mean because of his faith in God, he did many great things. Godly men make great decisions even in the midst of difficult times. You know, anyone can make a decision, you might say, well, most people, we should say, can make a good decision even in times when, when times are going easy, when times are relaxed, when nothing pressing is really going on. But when we start putting a Christian in difficult times and start applying pressure, that's when we see the real character of that individual. Because anyone can be faithful to God when there are no worries, when the sky is clear, the sun is out, there's nothing going on in our lives that cause us grief. You might say it's easy to become a Christian then, or to remain a faithful Christian then. But when the storm clouds gather, and when the thunder starts hitting, what kind of person are we? Moses was a man he made many great decisions throughout his life. He was not a man who was without fault, but he was a man who strove to follow God, and that's how the Bible records him. A man who did many things by faith, a one who which we can learn many lessons from. Let's begin by looking at the first idea, that is that Moses refused some things in life. You know, there are those today who would never refuse anything in life. Even if it's, you might say, even if it's associated with sinful things, they would still accept it because that gift or that ability or those things, those possessions, might bring them great joy. For instance, I remember a man who used to go, he would travel, when he traveled, he would stop at the casinos, he wouldn't gamble, but he would stay in their hotels at the casinos because they were cheaper, they would give you cheaper rates, as he said, in an effort to try to get you to go out and gamble. Now, think about that, is that a gift you want to be associated with? A lower price, but yet what does the price come with? It comes with a very ugly image, doesn't it? I hope we never find ourselves walking into or walking out of a casino. Instead, I hope we find, as we find from the life of Moses, we always try to avoid any appearance of evil. You know, it's not just abstaining from evil, but it's abstaining also from the appearance of evil. You know, we talk about sometimes, I've heard the illustration in various different ways, if your car broke down, would you walk the block to the bar, or would you walk the mile to the grocery store down the street? I think we should walk the mile, don't you? Because we don't want to paint ourselves or put ourselves in a position where we could bring blasphemy upon the name of Christ, upon the name of a Christian. We have a lot of people in this world today who are already doing that. We don't need to do it anymore, do we? And we find Moses is a man who, who did great things and made great decisions even during difficult times. And he refused some things in life. You know, we don't often refuse much in life, but Moses did. Hebrews 11, beginning in verse 26, we'll find that he refused some earthly possessions. He refused earthly possessions. There are those today who, if they don't need something that's being given away, oh, they'll take it. Moses wasn't that way. Hebrews 11, verse 26 says, Assuming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked for what? He looked to the reward. That is a reference to the eternal reward. He looked to paradise. 
He knew that this life was just the beginning. That when this life is over is when the Christian really begins to experience the joys of life. Life eternal. He says there in verse 26, Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. Now Moses didn't live during the time of Christ, did he? But he knew the Son of God was going to come one day. He knew being a follower of God, which is what he was in Old Testament times, was far greater than obtaining and relying and embracing the riches. As the Bible says in verse 26, the riches, the, uh, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. <clears throat> Did Egypt have its treasures? Most definitely. There are some things more valuable than earthly treasures, though, isn't there? Matthew 6, verses 19 and 20 says here, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But he says in, instead in verse 20, But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. He goes on to say, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Moses knew where his heart needed to be, and it needed to be focused upon God, didn't it? He said, I'll rather suffer being a follower of God than to take the treasures of Egypt. They're going to decay, going to fall apart eventually one day. I'd rather do that and gain heaven than to take these temporary riches that, that, that rust and, and moth can, the rust and moth can destroy, that thieves can break in and steal. I'd rather reject all those things and follow God instead. Matthew 6, verse 21. So he refused some things in life. He refused earthly possessions, but he also refused earthly power. And we would think, well, he was a man of God. He was a leader for God, and no doubt he was. But we find in Hebrews 11, verse 24, By faith Moses, when he came of age, refused to be called the, sons of the son of Pharaoh's daughter. That position came with authority or power, and he said, no, I do not want it. Because when you were in Pharaoh's house, you are given, automatically being in Pharaoh's house, some degree of power and authority and influence. The Bible tells us there in verse 24, when he became of age, it means it came time for him to receive that type of power. He refused it in verse 24. It wasn't that he just said, I don't want to be called a son of Pharaoh's daughter. He, the Bible says he refused it. If he refused something, it seems to be the idea that it, they, he was asked or requested upon more than once. No, I don't want that. No, I don't want that. No, I refuse to have that position. Why? Because he knew what came with that. The Bible says there in verse 24, he, re, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. We find later because of the passing pleasures of sin, he knew that those pleasures were only temporary. Moses was not a perfect man, but he had his head, you might say he had a level head upon himself. Yeah, all this stuff looks great, but it's going to fall apart one day. Yeah, it could be great to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter and have power, but what? I'm going to lose heaven if I do, because that position in life will lead me down to do what? Well, who did Pharaoh and the sons of Pharaoh and all them, who did they worship? Not the God of the Bible. Thus, Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter because he wanted nothing to do with any of that. He refused that position of power. Hebrews 11, verse 24. The rich young ruler found something that was lacking his life. In, Matthew, in Mark 10, rather, in verse 17, the Bible says, Now, as he was going out to the road, one came running, running, knelt before him, and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, there are those who ask this question who sincerely want to know the answer, and there are those who want to hear you tell them what they want to really hear. Does anyone ever go to the Bible looking for what they believe is the truth? All the time. But when someone goes to the Bible looking not for what they believe is the truth, but what actually is the truth of the matter, that's, those are two different things, isn't it? Verse uh, in 17 says, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? 
No one is good but one. That is God. Christ is the best example of humility. He's the Son of God. He's saying, why are you calling me good? No one is good but God. He was the prime example of humility. Verse 19, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. He's saying, you know all these things. You know what you ought to do to inherit eternal life under the old law in which they live, right? Verse 20, and he answered and said to him, teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. Verse 21, Christ knew what kind of man he was dealing with, didn't he? Oh, you kept all these things? Then what are you really wanting? You're wanting to be perfect. Verse 21, Then Jesus, looking at him, lo loved him, and said to him, One thing you lack, go your, go your way, sell whatever you have, and give it to the poor, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. Christ knew where this man's weak spot was, and he punched it, didn't he? Oh, I've done all these things, Lord. What else do I need to do? Sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Sell everything you have. All your possessions, which no doubt this man was clinging to, because we know this in verse 22, and the Bible says he was sad at this word and went away very sorrowful, for he had great possessions. It doesn't just mean he had a lot of possessions, but he had some nice ones, we might say. And he was very... Sorrowful, the Bible says there. He went away sorrowful, verse 22. And he goes on to say in verse 23 and following how difficult it is for a person who, a rich man, a clinging rich man, to enter into heaven, isn't it? You can't go through heaven carrying in all your possessions behind you. And we find here, we go back to Hebrews 11, verse 24. What was Moses doing? I don't want any of those things. Those possessions come with a hefty price and Moses said, I want no part of. The rich young ruler is told the same thing by Christ, but he said in verse 22, he went away sorrowful. He doesn't say, okay, Lord, I'll be back tomorrow and I will have sold everything. We don't find that. He went away sad and we went back to his possessions. We don't read anything else about him. Moses was not such a man. We find that Moses refused some things in life, not only possessions and power, but he refused the pleasures of sin. He refused the pleasures of sin. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 25, and we'll get to this next one in a second. Hebrews 11 verse 25 tells us, He chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Moses refused to enjoy those passing pleasures of sin. There is no lasting pleasure in sin. The pleasure is deceptive. It's brief. It's never really satisfying basic needs of mankind. That's why he referred to them there in Hebrews 11, verse 25. They're just passing pleasures of sin. Our next main point that we have there on the screen is Moses chose to accept some unpleasant things in life. He chose to accept them. That is, he chose to deal with them, to handle them, and to make the proper adjustments. We find in Hebrews 11 and verse 24 that he chose a life of sacrifice. Hebrews 11, 24 through 26. He refused to be called a son of Pharaoh's daughter. Verse 24. He chose to suffer affliction with the people of God and to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Verse 25. He has seen the reproach of Christ greater than the treasures in Egypt. And he suffered for it. He endured, he sacrificed those things. He sacrificed pleasures. He sacrificed positions of power. And he sacrificed earthly, earthly possessions and pleasures of sin. He sacrificed himself for the cause of God, didn't he? He gave up all those passing pleasures, all those positions of power he could have enjoyed. It would have cost him a price that he was not willing to pay. He chose a life of sacrifice, Hebrews 11, 24 through 26. He chose a life of suffering, Hebrews 11 and verse 25. He chose rather to suffer, to suffer affliction. When Moses and all those people were going through the wilderness, was Moses suffering? Remember how bad their complaint became at one point? When Moses comes before God and he says, I'm going to paraphrase slightly, he says, if this is how it's going to be, kill me here and now. 
Because what the people are, so, are complaining and disputing with him constantly. Do you remember how many people? Remember, we find later that God appoints some people to bear the load of Moses, so he doesn't have to bear it alone. He had to he had to choose, if I remember correctly, I believe about seventy different people to bear the load with him. Because Moses said, if this is how it's going to be all the way there, just kill me now, God. When he says he suffered, he means he suffered. Not just his own physical hardship, not just his own spiritual distress. He had to put it with everybody else's complaining and whining the entire way. But he suffered and he kept on doing and kept on following God. He did not quit just because he experienced some suffering. He also chose a life of, of service to God. Hebrews 11, verse 27 through 29 says, By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Meaning he what? The king's not going to like this, but I'm not, I don't care anyway. I'm going to follow God. You want to see an example of a man who goes against the law to, to do what pleases God? There's one. He didn't fear the, the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. He said, the king got nothing on what God can do to the unfaithful. I'm going to follow him. Verse 28, by faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians, attempting to do so, were drowned. Moses chose a life of service to God. Complete dedication to God. What were some of the reasons behind the choices of Moses? Moses was guided by faith. Hebrews 11 and verse 24. By faith, when Moses became of age. We continue reading about Moses through verse 29. By faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. As I said before, we can phrase it because of faith. Because of his faith in God, he chose to do these things. That means he did those things of his own accord, free will. God did not force Moses to do anything. Moses chose to do it. He chose to live a life of sacrifice. He chose to live a life of suffering. He chose to live a life of service to God. He chose each and every one of those things. God did not force him to do anything. Moses chose to do those things because he was guided by faith. Mo Moses followed the will and the word of God. Such faith is founded upon the hearing and obeying the Word of God, isn't it? Romans 10, verse 17, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Moses had faith because he literally heard the words of God from God Himself. I'm going to do what God has told me to do. I choose to do so. That verse is on so many people's walls and things, and unfortunately for some, not for all, but for some, it's just a bumper sticker. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua 24, verse 15. It's more than just a good verse. It's how the Christian should live, isn't it? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, on Father's Day, us fathers need to remember that. As for me and my house, despite what anyone else is doing, what anyone else says, what anyone else thinks, we're going to put God first. If you don't like it, go somewhere else. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. If you don't like it, we pray before dinner. This is how we do things in my house. If you don't like it, we have Bible studies. When you come over and your child stays with us, that's how we do things in my house. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And that's how we are to live each and every day. Moses was guided by faith. He sacrificed and endured, seeing him who is invisible. Note Moses says he saw him who is invisible. I Meaning he didn't have to see God with his physical eyes and know that God was there. Atheists and critics like to say, well, you can't test God. Yes, you can, just not with your foolish ideas of testing. I don't know why I'm listening so much to atheists who still can't prove their own ideas about creation in the beginning of time. You notice, if you ever listen to some of that, there's a lot of could have beens 
maybes, possibilities within there, not with God. In the beginning, God did not possibly create the earth. In the beginning, God what? Created the earth. He spoke and things began. Not a possibility. It is a certainty. He sacrificed. Moses sacrificed and endured seeing that same God, the Creator. Hebrews 11, verse 27. He forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. Meaning he left Egypt. He didn't fear the king. He feared God. For he endured as seeing him who is invisible. One can love and believe in the invisible God. 1 Peter 1, verse 8. Whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with a joy inexpressible and full of glory. Though now you do not see him, yet believing. We don't see God, but we believe in him. We know he is alive. We know he exists. We know and understand, not just by faith, but by evidence, His Son came down from heaven, dwelt among men, and died on the cross for us, rose three days later, and then went back to heaven. The evidence points us to each and every one of those things. Us living today, we never saw those things with our eyes, but we know they took place. We know God exists, and we know His Son is real. Though you do not see Him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Moses endured because of the reward. If it was just physical gain, Moses would not have done what he did. You can't pay a person enough to go through all the stuff that Moses did. All the things he endured, there was no, you know, Moses, this is, this is what waits you at the end of the, of the hardship. You know, here's your pot of gold if you get through all this, Moses. No way, that's not enough. What reward was he talking about? He's talking about the eternal reward. Hebrews 11, verse 6, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. God rewards more than any other person on this planet could ever begin to dream to do. The world rewards with finances and with physical things. The Lord rewards with eternity with Him. A life of peace and rest that cannot even be found on this earth. But God rewards us with that type of life that lasts for all eternity. There is no end. You ever been outside working in the heat and you think, boy, I wish 5 o'clock would hurry up and get here. Look, like it's never going to get here. With God, it's like that, only it's not in the heat. It's in a place of complete and total comfort. A place of rest for the weary. As the Bible tells us, Jesus tells us, He'll give us rest for our souls. That where He is, there we may also be. A life of worshiping and praising God for all that He has done for us. True and lasting peace is only found through God and it's only obtained through obedience to Him. There is no other way. He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. And there is no half-hearted effort. You think God doesn't see the half-hearted effort of people? I used to hear my father say that all the time. Either do it all the way or don't do it at all. But do your very best or don't do it all. It may not work out the best sometimes for me, but do it, do it the very best that you can. If you're going to do it half-heartedly, just go inside. Hebrews 11, verse 6, what? A rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Give Him your best that you have, all that you have. What are some lessons for us today? Moses made the right decision in view of eternity. Moses made the right decisions in view of eternity. He knew what was coming. He knew, he knew the Son of God, the Messiah, would come one day, not during his lifetime. But that, is, that didn't mean that Moses didn't believe he was coming. He did believe. Just like Abraham and so many other men of God in the Bible, they, who didn't get to see Christ coming, they knew that He was. Even they didn't get to see it. You remember when Christ is talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all those Jews, all the doubters, and He talks about how, he, how those of old would have loved to see what you see and hear what you hear. But they believed anyway that Christ was coming. 
Acts 3, verse 23, Moses is a leader and an example of righteousness. Acts 3, 20, 22 and 23, And Moses truly said to the fathers, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him ye shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. Who is he talking about? The Son of God. That was long before Christ had ever come onto the scene. And Moses says, He's coming. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. That prophet is a reference to Christ. That prophet is not just any prophet. Now Christ is referred to sometimes in the New Testament as the prophet. The prophet, meaning what? The prophet. Christ, the Son of God. He's not just any prophet. And there were great prophets of old. But Christ was and is the prophet prophet. He says in verse 23, And it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly, utterly destroyed from among the people. Even Moses, a preacher, when he comes, you better listen and obey. If not, you have no hope. All the way back to Moses. He'll raise up a prophet like me, and him you better hear. Moses was there at the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew 17, verses 1 through 3. And this again shows what his importance and obedience to God. If he wasn't so obedient to God, would he have been there on the Mount of Transfiguration? Moses 17, or Matthew 17, verses 1 through 3 says, After six days Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him, talking with Christ. Moses was there, wasn't he? Did Moses get to see Christ? The Bible says, yes, he did. Years and years later, but he got to see Christ. All those things he said, all that dedication paid off for Moses. What must mankind do today? Mankind must refuse the pleasures of sin like Moses did. He refused the earthly possessions. He refused earthly power. He refused the pleasures of sin in general. He refused all those things because they would only lead him away from where he wanted to be. And that was with God. We should let God's Word guide our decisions. God spoke, Moses obeyed. Was he without fault? No. But he was a man who strove throughout his life to put God first. You can't talk about Moses without talking about God, can you? You can't talk about God without talking about Moses. One of the greatest leaders of the Old Testament, the greatest leader, one of the greatest leaders of the Bible was Moses. As we close this morning, we must remember that all choices have consequences. Good or bad, they all have consequences or results because of our choices. Look at Ecclesiastes 12, 13 to 14. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Choose wisely what you do. God will judge you for it. For that reason, let us be wise enough to use God's Word to guide our decisions. When we fail and make mistakes, we can repent of those things as a Christian. We can confess our sins to God, repent of those things, and God will forgive us of those things, as John tells us there in 1 John. If we are not a Christian, we can begin making godly decision by making the most important one that we will ever make. And that is following God. Having believed that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, confessing Christ, repenting of our sins, being immersed in baptism so our sins can be washed away because without it they will never be washed away without it. And then we remain faithful to God then we can have eternal life and we can begin and continue to, to make godly decisions that are pleasing to God and that will result in us having heaven as our home. Moses made many decisions, 
Some good, some not so good. But he chose always to obey God. And when he failed, he corrected it. That's what makes him a man of God. That's what kept him a man of God. This morning, as you think about these things, we can help you or encourage you in any way. You can come forward now. It's going to be standing and singing the song that's been selected.